Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Chanel Roberts. I'm the project manager for the Atlantic Medical Group CME program. And I just want to thank you for taking time out for joining us uh, for this very critical CME. Um, I'm not going to waste any time with uh, further introductions, but I do want to turn it over to Dr. Tim Lice, who will uh, give you the latest update. Tim, feel free to go ahead and share your screen. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I am Tim Lisi. I'm the Director of Pharmacy for Atlantic Health System. Um, with me today, I have Dimple Patel, who is our clinical pharmacist for infectious disease, um, who is stationed at Morristown Medical Center. I also have Eamon Mandali, who's one of our ID pharmacists, and I believe Alecki is also on from Chilton, is one of our ID clinical pharmacists. I used to be a real pharmacist, and now I, I sit here at 475. So um, without further ado, I'll actually kick it off to Dimple, who is our resident expert and will be um, talking about the outpatient therapeutics for COVID-19. Thanks, Tim. Um, so quickly to go through some of the objectives for this webinar, um, we're going to review the available outpatient therapies for mild to moderate COVID. Um, we're going to discuss the Atlantic Health System COVID-19 outpatient treatment algorithm, and um, we're going to walk through some strategies to overcome some of the logistical challenges um, that we've seen with prescribing outpatient therapeutic agents. So first I wanted to start with the NIH guideline recommendations um, as there have been some significant changes in the past couple of weeks. So this last guideline update um, came out a couple of weeks ago and they have recommendations for the therapeutic management of non-hospitalized adults with COVID-19. Um, so the preferred therapies they list here are Paxlovid is our first line agent. Um, this is an order of preference. Um, they've also included remdesivir, the three day um, course, uh, which um, is an option. Um, un unfortunately, we're not um, able to do this at Atlantic Health at this time. Um, alternative therapies that they have listed are the monoclonal antibody bevtilovimab and malnupiravir. Um, this is the most significant update to this guideline um, change here is that the monoclonal antibody has now been moved from preferred therapy to alternative therapy, and we'll go into um, some reasons why. So this slide here reviews the efficacy of the various antivirals um, for mild to moderate COVID-19, um, and the primary endpoints for most of these studies was um, hospitalization or death at day 29. Um, and, you know, another commonality of these studies is that they really focused on patients that were at high risk for progression to severe disease. Um, so these were the included population. Um, also of note, the, the studies excluded vaccinated patients or patients that previously had um, COVID disease. So given that background, um, we see the relative risk reduction with Paxlovid compared to placebo was about 88% in their landmark study. Um, I've included citrovimab here, although the um, EUA was recently removed for citrovimab, um, but just to give some um, baseline with um, MAB efficacy, citrovimab in their clinical trial showed a 79% relative risk reduction um, in progression to hospitalization or death uh, compared to placebo. Um, Bevtilovimab, you see listed here, um, was recently authorized by the FDA. Um, however, there are no clinical outcomes data in high-risk patients available at this time. Um, the EUA approval was really based on non-clinical viral neutralization data um, for the Omicron variant and its subvariants. So um, Bevtilovimab does retain activity um, against the Omicron BA2 subvariant. Um, Citrovimab does not, which is why the authorization was revoked recently. And then finally, Malnupiravir study demonstrated um, a, a moderate relative risk reduction in hospitalization or death um, of 31%. And so I think the um, relative efficacies here kind of go hand in hand with the um, NIH treatment recommendations for the order of preference of the therapies. So we've looked at a lot of this to develop our Atlantic Health System outpatient um, treatment algorithm here. And I'll, I'll go through this, this slide. It's a little bit busy, but this, this really does outline um, all of the considerations for how to screen your patients. 
Um, so first and foremost, we, we need to meet EUA criteria to consider any of these agents as they are all still under EUA and not fully FDA approved. Um, so the first criteria is that they must be symptomatic with mild to moderate disease um, and not be hospitalized. <clears throat> um, in patients who are hypoxic, um, we, we really should be kind of sending them to um, the ED for further evaluation um, for possible hospitalization or additional therapeutics. Um, but in, in these symptomatic patients with mild to moderate disease that are not hypoxic, um, we can proceed down this algorithm. Um, they also need to be at least 12 years of age and older, weighing at least 40 kilos. Um, and they need to be at high risk for progression to severe disease. So um, this, this comes directly from the EUA. These criteria include older age, obesity, as well as um, a variety of various comorbidities. Um, so if you've screened your patient and they meet all of these criteria, then we would proceed down the algorithm and then assess um, time from onset of symptoms. Um, so of note here, if the patient has, has been symptomatic for more than seven days, there are no treatments that are authorized um, to, to treat patients later on in their course. Um, so they should be advised to um, monitor their pulse ox and um, present to the ED if, if they show signs of hypoxia. However, if they are earlier in their um, symptom course, um, if they're less than five days in, um, we would kind of screen for Paxlovid eligibility. Um, so some of the criteria are listed here, and I'll go through them more in subsequent slides as well. Um, the most notable um, possible contraindications might be significant drug interactions that can't be managed, um, uh, renal failure, um, severe hepatic dysfunction. If the patient does not have any of these criteria, we can consider Paxlovid here. Um, if the patient does have a contraindication, um, we would proceed down the, the pathway and next consider a monoclonal antibody. So um, we have, within Atlantic Health, prioritized monoclonal antibody treatment above treatment of, with malnupiravir based on potential um, efficacy from other monoclonal antibodies. Although, again, given the caveat, we don't have clinical data for bebtilovimab specifically. Um, if the bebtilovimab is available and um, accessible to the patient, then we would proceed with ordering bebtilovimab. If not, we would ensure that the patient is um, at least 18 years old and not pregnant, um, and then order molnupiravir in that patient. Um, if the patient is a pediatric patient or pregnant, there are unfortunately no treatment options once we've reached that that part of the algorithm. So just to go through the oral antiviral agents in some more detail, um, Paxlovid or nirmatrelvir ritonavir um, works by inhibiting the main protease of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, ritonavir is an inhibitor of cytochrome P453A, um, which metabolizes nirmatrelvir, and so inhibiting this enzyme boosts nirmatrelvir levels. It's used very similarly to how we use ritonavir um, with HIV protease inhibitors. The EUA parameters for Paxlovid are specifically, again, limited to mild to moderate disease um, in patients who are within five days of symptom onset um, and who are at least 12 years of age at high risk for progression to severe disease. The um, dosing is dependent on renal function, and, and so we see um, there is a relatively high pill burden with Paxlovid. Some patients with normal renal function, we're looking at um, six tablets daily. Um, in patients with moderate renal impairment, we're looking at four tablets daily um, divided BID. And again, it's not recommended in patients with an EGFR less than 30 um, or patients with severe hepatic dysfunction. The major adverse effects we've seen with Paxlovid are dyskusia. Um, this is very, very common with the ritonavir component, um, where patients often complain about metallic taste. Um, <clears throat> in the clinical trial for Paxlovid, it was reported in about 6% of patients, but um, using ritonavir in HIV patients, we've seen um, rates of dyskusia upwards of 20%. Um, we'd also see diarrhea, hypertension, myalgias, and hepatotoxicity in the clinical trials. 
again, the clinical efficacy was shown to be an 88% relative risk reduction in hospitalization or death by day 29 compared to placebo. Um, and then some special considerations. There are limited human data in pregnancy. Um, the NIH guidelines do kind of draw from um, experience using ritonavir in pregnancy and suggest that if um, benefit outweighs risk, then we can consider using Paxlovid in pregnant patients. So this is <clears throat> something that we will be looking at um, for our, our algorithm as well. Um, in terms of drug interactions, this is the, the most major special consideration we want to focus on, and we'll go into some more detail on that in a few minutes. But again, ritonavir is a strong CYP3A inhibitor. Um, Nirmatrelvir is also a CYP3A substrate, obviously. Um, and then I have the University of Liverpool interaction checker listed here, which we'll go into in more detail in a few moments. Um, in contrast, looking at the um, uh, uh, considerations for molnupiravir, um, it works by inhibiting viral replication um, through incorporation into the viral RNA polymerase um, and causes an accumulation of um, deleterious errors causing uh, catastrophe and um, inhibition of replication at that point. Um, similar to Paxlovid, this is indicated in patients who are um, presenting with mild to moderate COVID within five days of symptom onset. Um, unlike Paxlovid, this is only indicated for adults 18 years and older um, who are at high risk for progression. And for molnupiravir, the EUA criteria specifically state that um, we can only use molnupiravir in patients for whom alternative authorized treatment options are not accessible or clinically appropriate. So um, we, sh we should consider Paxlovid prior to considering molnupiravir. Um, again, with dosing, also a relatively high pill burden, it's, it's eight capsules a day divided Q12. Um, adverse effects we see are diarrhea, nausea, dizziness. Um, again, the clinical efficacy is about 31% relative risk reduction in hospitalization or death. Um, and, and the major thing to keep in mind here is that in, in pregnancy, um, there was some embryo fetal toxicity demonstrated in animal studies, so it's recommended to avoid use in pregnancy, um, and that we should be assessing pregnancy status and counseling patients to use reliable contraception for some time after um, discontinuing therapy. In addition, there was some bone and cartilage toxicity seen in rat studies, and so um, it, the, the benefit does not outweigh the risk in pediatric patients, and, and thus the EUA limits to use in adults. Okay, so I, I wanted to go into some more detail on some of the logistical considerations and other clinical considerations, so the, the first of which is um, checking for drug-drug interactions with Paxlovid. Um, again, these are significant and very complex. Ritonavir is one of the strongest CYP3A inhibitors that, that we have available. Um, so it's very important that we review all concomitant medications before prescribing Paxlovid. And this, this includes um, over-the-counter meds, herbals, and recreational drugs. There are several resources um, that are available to assess these drug interactions. So the Paxlovid fact sheet actually has six pages worth of drug interactions listed there. So that's, that's a nice reference um, that's available. The NIH treatment guidelines also have a similar table with the drug interactions listed in a user-friendly format. Um, but we wanted to spend a little bit more time diving into the University of Liverpool drug interaction checker, which is actually endorsed by the NIH guidelines and is, is a pretty user-friendly tool. Um, so. So first, this is if you're if you're an Epic user, this is what you would see when you go to order Paxlovid in Epic. Um, the dosing uh, is broken down by eGFR, and um, the appropriate dosing is is populated. Um, if you were to click on this blue text here uh, to open the full order, you'll see a, a link to the drug interaction checker linked within. So, if you were to click on that blue text, this is what you'll see here. And then um, we have a link to the University of Liverpool Drug Interaction Checker embedded within the order. So once you click on that link, it opens up the website for the Drug Interaction Checker. 
um, you would enter the COVID therapeutic in this first column. So you can put in Paxlovid here um, and then enter the patient's co-medications in the second column. Um, I do want to point out here that this checker doesn't recognize brand names. We must search by the generic name. Um, so it won't recognize Lipitor. You'll have to enter atorvastatin. So using that example, um, looking for interactions between a, a Paxlovid and atorvastatin, um, I entered Paxlovid here. It does recognize the brand name of Pax, Paxlovid. Um, and then I entered atorvastatin in the second column. And so the potential interaction is listed, listed here. Um, if you were to click on this more info button, it'll open up more details on the actual interaction as well as management recommendations. So this is what that looks like. Um, this is actually a really nice feature. Um, I, I know that there's many um, tools that we can use for checking drug interactions, um, Lexicomp, uh, Hippocrates, et cetera. Um, the, this tool here I think is um, very, very user-friendly because it actually provides recommendations on how to manage this interaction. So um, this summary here kind of states that we should be stopping the atorvastatin during therapy if possible and continuing three days later um, after restarting three days after the end of the Paxlovid course. Um, and if for some reason the atorvastatin must be continued during therapy to reduce the dose to 10 milligrams daily and resume the normal dose after completion of therapy. Um, so there, there are very specific management recommendations provided within this tool, um, which, which is very useful. And again, this is endorsed by the NIH. Okay, and if you had a patient obviously on multiple medications, um, you can go ahead and enter multiple medications in the co-medication field and all of the interactions will be listed on the side as well. So if you're e-scribing the Paxlovid through EPIC, the drug interaction check that's embedded within EPIC will be performed versus the EPIC medication list. Um, however, this may not include the patient's full medication list, depending on if they see um, providers that are, are not within EPIC or not within the health system. Um, it, it should alert that most interactions ex exist at a minimum, but we have seen that it's um, there are some combinations that are not picked up, and we're, we're looking deeper um, right now at, at these interactions to see if we can get them flagged a little bit more clearly. Um, and again, as I had mentioned, the, uh, the EPIC monograph will not necessarily provide up-to-date recommendations on the management of the interaction. And then I, I wanted to you know, plug the role of the pharmacist as well. The pharmacist is your safety net. So um, whenever possible, it, it's preferred to send the prescription to the same pharmacy the patient us usually uses if the Paxlovid is available there. Um, if the patient's usual pharmacy doesn't carry the Paxlovid, we would want to consider sending the prescription to the same chain that the patient uses to ensure um, that the full medication list is available and, and screened. Um, so, for example, you know, if the patient usually uses CVS in Morristown, and when we check to see if CVS in Morristown carries it, it does not. Um, the CVS in Whippany may carry it, and so you can go ahead and send the prescription there. Um, being on the same system kind of ensures that we're, we're checking the meds more thoroughly. So that brings us to locating pharmacies that carry Paxlovid. Um, so I believe this link was sent out to the, to the larger group. This is a federal therapeutics locator. Um, this is a tool provided by the government that um, outlines the supply available at each pharmacy. So when you click on this link, um, you would want to click here and select Paxlovid or whichever therapeutic you're looking for. Um, and then we would go ahead and click on the magnifying glass and enter the city, state, or zip code to narrow the search area. And again, um, a link to this therapeutics locator is embedded within the Paxlovid order at this point. This is relatively new, um, and it may take a couple of days to actually go live, but th this will be available shortly. So once you do that, um, I put in Morristown zip code here. The results pop up here. Um, 
So we see that each um, pharmacy location is listed as well as the number of courses that are available at that location. And then you can use the zoom here to zoom in or um, drag the map to narrow your search area if you'd like. So that, that kind of sums up the, the Paxlovid ordering. Um, so I wanted to move on to ordering bevtilovimab. Um, again, based on the lack of clinical data, the EUA here limits use of bevtilovimab to high-risk patients for whom alternative therapeutic options are not accessible. So again, we want to reserve this agent for patients um, who have contraindications to Paxlovid. This one is a little bit different than the previous MABs. Um, this is a 30-second push followed by an hour observation period, and we're doing this at our Atlantic Health Infusion Centers. Um, and it's similar to the previous MABs in, in the sense that you would order it the same way through the um, COVID-19 monoclonal antibody smart set to place the order. Um, and we're regularly updating the smart set um, to include the MAB of the month. Um, so once the order is placed, the patient is contacted by the infusion center, usually within 48 hours of the order being placed in order to schedule the infusion. Um, and they aim to schedule patients for within seven days of symptom onset to, to be sure we're meeting the EUA parameters there. Um, the first available appointment will be offered. Um, and currently we're <clears throat> doing the MAB infusions at Morristown, Overlook, and Newton Infusion Centers. Um, all of these infusion centers are not open every day, and so um, the, the patient is offered the first available, um, even if the location may not be ideal for the patient. At this point, the supplies of Bevtilovimab are adequate. Um, we may come up to a point at some point where we need to prioritize utilization of Bevtilovimab based on risk factors, as we had done um, in the winter with Citrovimab, and we would use the same criteria that we had used at that point for scheduling um, with risk factors. Okay, and then moving on to ordering of molnupiravir. Again, based on the um, moderate clinical efficacy, the EUA also limits this agent to patients for whom alternative treatment options are not accessible or clinically appropriate. We can use the same therapeutics locator to find pharmacies that carry molnupiravir. Um, and Again, the biggest um, point here is to ensure that the patient is not pregnant um, and to counsel patients of reproductive potential to use effective contraception consistently. Um, for, for females, this would be for at least four days after the last dose of molnupiravir and for males for at least three months after the last dose of molnupiravir. Um, and um, breastfeeding should be avoided until four days after the last dose. Okay, so then a, a few final reminders. Um, these agents are all authorized by emergency use authorization. Again, they are not fully FDA approved yet, so we are limited to um, using them according to the outlined EUA criteria. Um, these EUAs are for patients at high risk for progression to severe disease, so they must have one of those high risk comorbidities. Um, Again, these are EUAs, so we need to provide the patient with the FDA patient fact sheets and um, counsel the patient as to the risks and benefits and document um, that the patient agrees to use of this authorized agent. I wanted to spend 30 seconds on pre-exposure prophylaxis with Evusheld. Um, so this is a monoclonal antibody combination that inhibits mm -hmm. the spike protein-directed attachment for pre-exposure prophylaxis. So Obviously, prevention is, is the key, and we want to get there as much as possible. Um, this agent is authorized for patients who are not currently infected or recently exposed to the virus and have moderate to severe immune compromise and may not mount an adequate immune response to vaccination, or for patients for whom vaccination is not recommended due to a history of severe adverse reactions to COVID vaccine. Um, so. So for this group of patients, um, these are the, the outlined um, moderate to severe immune compromise conditions. Um, this, this agent would provide an added layer of protection um, in addition to vaccination uh, for patients who may not mount an adequate immune response. So uh, I think the specialists are primarily ordering Evusheld. Um, 
you know, any any primary care provider within Atlantic Health can also order Evusheld, but um, you know, this is something to keep in mind for for your patients that uh, present with these conditions. <clears throat> okay, so we have a few minutes for questions. I think we can open it up at this point. I can actually go down the chat here. I started answering some in the chat. Um, the first one was <clears throat> how long for between statins and starting Paxlovid, and it's actually um, different for each one. Um, so I actually threw it all the way in the bottom of the chat, um, which is not loading for me now. Uh, but lovastatin and simvastatin, you have to hold for 12 hours before starting. Um, for torvastatin and rosuvastatin, um, there's no hold period. It's just temporary discontinuation while the patient is on Paxlovid. <clears throat> um, the next question was uh, asymptomatic patients that are tested positive due to exposure. Can we use Paxlovid? Okay. So if they test positive, um, they still have to fit the. I'm sorry. It was an 11. I don't know. So back then, can be Oh, we had a question. Um, if they are tested positive and they fit the EUA criteria for mild to moderate disease at risk of progression, um, they would fit the EUA criteria for Paxlovid. N none of the pharmacies that I'm aware of, and Atlantic Health is one of them, are policing this. We're not asking for positive tests, um, just to throw that out there. Um, but for them to fit the EUA criteria, they do have to test positive. Tim, uh, yeah. this is Chanel. You do have a question, a hand raised from Dr. Angelo. Dr. Angelo, do you want to answer? You can unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah. yeah, hi, how you doing? Um, yeah, what do we do as far as there a, a service that we refer to for people who are long haul um, or have long haul conditions or symptoms? Is there something that, that Atlantic Health is doing? I know Central State talks about putting together something, but is there a defined clinic that we can send long haulers to? Um, there is, there is, Dr. Angela. This is um, Janine Boulin. I'm one of the internists in Westfield. So there is a post COVID recovery clinic through Atlantic Health. The information is on the website and you can refer your patients there. It's multidisciplinary, uh, pulmonary, cardiac. Um, so although all that information will be on the Atlantic Health website. How local is that to Central State though? Because I'm in Monmouth County here and people may not want to go up to Summit. Um, I can see, I mean, I think Summit is the closest area with this. I will reach out to Dr. Pettis and see if there's something local closer to you. Hi. Guys, this is Dan Markley. I'm one of the guys that runs the clinic. Um, so we're in Cedar Knolls as well as Summit. Um, if you go through the website, there's a lot of contact information there. If you have questions, surely send me a message and we can find a way to get in. And if it's inconvenient, we can always find a spot in our Pompton Lakes office as well, if that helps. Uh, but we can try to find a location that works for you a little bit better. But Summit and Cedar Knolls are the two main sites. Hi, uh, if I can interject, this is Rod Pedowitz. We, we absolutely do have a post-recovery program at, at Central State. It's very successful. And patients can be referred there through EPIC or sending them to the Health Awareness Center at Central State. But we have a very robust program here. Not quite as big as Atlantic's, but we it is pretty successful here too. Thank you. All right, Tim, I guess um, you can keep going. Not a problem. I know we're coming up against the half hour. Um, Dimple and I can stay on for anybody that does have more questions. Um, but I will try and get through as many as we can in the next two minutes. Um, I think I missed one. Why can't we treat as an inpatient with the antibody treatment? Um, for patients that are coming into the hospital primarily with a COVID diagnosis, the EUAs prevent us from using any of these as an inpatient. They're strictly outpatient therapies. However, there is a gray area of the EUAs that if a patient's coming in for something completely different, found to be incidentally positive for COVID, or... Um, is a you know non-present on admission COVID. Um, there are some options, and we have been able to uh, use the EUA to help treat patients with the appropriate um, antiviral in those cases. <clears throat> uh, I think, I'm sorry, I'm uh, just scrolling through here. Uh, if the studies have an evaluated response in vaccinated patients, should we pres be prescribing for vaccinated boosted individuals? Um, this is a probably a much bigger discussion is part of the EUA and many, many conversations we have. None of the criteria have taken vaccination status really into consideration. Um, Dimple, I don't know if you have any further to add to that. Um, yeah, that's that's exactly right. The, the EUA don't 
don't limit the use of these agents um, to unvaccinated patients. Um, and it's also important to keep in mind that all of these studies were conducted during periods of previous variants. Um, so the Paxlovid study was primarily during during Delta. Um, and we know that, you know, with Omicron, we're seeing different rates of breakthrough infection. So um, it, it's reasonable to, um, you know, still consider these agents in patients who are vaccinated and boosted, um, although we don't have great, great information on um, whether the treatment effect would be as dramatic. Yeah, we, we could spend another couple hours on that topic alone. Um, recommendations for patients on Coumadin, since they're quarantined, would they not be able to get their IRR within five days quarantine? I, I think you hit the, the take home message there. The EUA specifically says to monitor INR with warfarin therapy. Um, if we cannot monitor the INR, I think that leads to probably not using Paxlovid. I have not heard or seen any patients um, with concomitant Paxlovid or warfarin to even have an anecdotal response as to how I've seen INRs respond. I don't know if, if Dimple, if you have seen that co-administration. Nope, have not yet. I think for the most part, I'm hearing that people are avoiding Paxlovid in these in those patients. Uh, oh, urine pregnancy tests on all patients with molnupiravir. That is not stipulated in the EUA. Um, there has been a lot of discussions about pregnancy and, and what to do in those situations, um, but a urine pregnancy test is not uh, one of those uh, recommendations or uh, requirements. So I, I probably would say it's it's up to the clinical judgment of the prescriber. But I will add that um, I think as you counsel your patients on this, that it is important to do the proper documentation in EPIC and um, the the um, fact sheet should be provided ahead of time. And this way it's documented that the patient has received the fact sheet. So whether you do that by sending them to a link um, via internet or on the patient portal, but it is good for them to review it and then you can document that you've canceled and that's been reviewed. So same thing with documenting pregnancy status or that you've at least discussed it. All of that should be part of your um, assessment. Good. I think that's a similar conversation with recent tests with renal function um, before prescribing Paxlovid. I think that there's a concern there um, that, that may be a consideration, but again, it would be a clinical judgment. There is nothing in the EUA that says you must check renal function prior to prescribing um, Paxlovid. Um, next, EPIC formulating auto feeding the patient's current medications for the interaction checker. We've been testing this. Um, so how EPIC works with the drug drug interactions is utilizing first data bank, with his, which is just another a different um, drug interaction tool. Um, currently, uh, we have our EPIC team looking at why some are firing and some are not firing. Um, right now, the EUA, as Dimple mentioned, uh, endorses the Liverpool uh, drug interaction checking tool. Um, I've, we've heard Hippocrates, uh, Lexicomp, Micromedics, any of these drug interaction tools will work. EPIC will flag and fire for contraindicated um, drug interactions. Um, but as we were testing this over the past couple of days, there are some inconsistencies with the automatic checking in EPIC. So it's not incorrect. It may it may filter out, say, a Torvastatin because of the way it's built to limit the amount of, of um, alerts that pop in your face. Um, so that's one of the, you know, one of the things we've been working on is decreasing that alert fatigue. So specifically looking at how to manage these drug interactions, statins is a good example. Um, it's not contraindicated, but there is a specific um, hold or discontinuation process for that. So that's where we recommend any of the other drug interaction checkers. And if I'm missing anything, feel free to raise your hand or, or jump in and. Um, Dr. K has a good question. Is there hey. access to these medications for patients who are uninsured? Yes, there is no cost. We, we did not. Uh, remdesivir is, is separate um, because that is uh, we are not receiving that under an EUA right now, but Paxlovid, Molnupiravir, Bebtilivimab, and Evusheld, as well as the COVID vaccinations are available to all um, free of charge. We do not um, collect a fee for that um, for the drug. Um, if there is a, a commercial payer, we do bill for administration, but not for the drug itself. They've all been provided um, by the government. 
There's quite a bit of chat about fact sheets with regard to these therapies. Can someone uh, share about that, please? I can. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm still scrolling down there. The um, the EUA fact sheets, the best way to get to them <clears throat> is through the link because they do get updated from time to time. Even if they change grammar and uh, nothing major, there will be changes to these. So we did link to them in Epic where it will always be updated. Links right to the web page and you can usually print it off right from the web page, um, which will always give you the most up to date fact sheet for the patients and they're available in English and in Spanish. Um, will the ED be prescribing the PO meds to patients upon discharge from the ED? We are working on a process for this. Um, we've had a couple uh, uh, questions over the weekend. Uh, there's just logistical challenges. We can do it. The, the Board of Pharmacy in New Jersey has taken this up as well um, because there's licensing barriers. Um, but if you do have a patient in the ED that you'd like to discharge um, from one of our EDs, we do have access to Paxlovid. Call the pharmacy. Um, we generally will work with you to get those patients the meds. Um, especially where, where we can't send the patient to a pharmacy that's local to them. Um, that has been a barrier as well. Da, 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 da. Did I miss anything? I'm not sure. One additional question says, um, are we using Paxlovid to help any long, uh, long COVID symptoms? As part of the EUA, it has to be given within the first, I think it's five to seven, but one of our, one of my clinical pharmacists can certainly jump in there. Days after symptom onset, I don't know if we have any data um, for uh, patients with longer COVID or for symptoms that are persisting beyond that five to seven day window. Is that correct, Dimple? Within five days, yep. Five days. Any other questions that I'm missing here? I'm kind of scrolling through. The Dr. Kirshner uh, put a follow up uh, to the um, fact sheets in the chat that says would prefer to place the fact sheet in the patient's after visit summary as most of these patients will be seen on telehealth. You can't hand them printed sheets. Hi, is it possible to see the COVID locator, uh, the COVID, the Paxlovid locator link um, again? Sure, I could actually put that right in the chat and we can actually look to see if the uh, AVS will also print the fact sheets. I can grab the Epic team on that. That does make sense because obviously a lot of these are um, telehealth visits. I did see another question here. Oh, if a patient has no symptoms with tests positive and is a high risk for progression, are they candidates for Paxlovid? Um, this is always a, a something that comes up because if a patient is really high risk, um, we have trouble saying, okay, if they are just turned positive this morning, you know, are we waiting too long before they actually get symptomatic or not? Uh, so again, it is a clinical decision, uh, but the EUA does say they have to be <clears throat> symptomatic with mild to moderate disease at high risk of progression. Um, but again, if you have somebody that just turned positive this morning, are we really going to wait for them if they truly are high risk for um, progression? Dr. Broadwick, you have a question? With reference to what we said. <laughs> See if I don't echo now. One last try. One last try. Last try. Last try. Last try. Last try. Last try. Are you using two audio devices? If you are, just turn one off and then we'll be able to hear you.
Ball Ray, and I'll grab this question. For patients with gout on colchicine, do we not prescribe or do we hold medication for several days? I'm just looking at the EUA where it says, it, you know, co-administration is contraindicated, um, but I, I did not look at the Liverpool checker. So I think that's where I would go next um, to see if there's uh, further management recommendations there. I'm going to try one more time. There we go. There we go. Sorry, with reference to uh, what was said about adding the uh, patient information to the um, after visit summary, um, I I've avoided doing that just with the um, monoclonals because by the time we're sending that, we've already made the order. So in theory, we're putting closing the barn door after the horse has left because mm. they're not supposed to put the order in until they've read them. <laughs> so what I've done is just you know, I've copied and put a uh, and pasted that onto a blank letter to the patient, and I send it out even as I'm speaking to them or before I have the conversation. If I see the report, and uh, if you alert them through my chart, they're able to get that and review it even before you have to close the chart and the AVM comes out. ABS comes out. Excuse me. Yeah, I think that's a very important point. Um, I think. I would encourage everyone, uh, you know, I don't think Paxlovid and certainly not monoclonal antibodies are something just to be called in without um, the appropriate assessment, conversation, documentation, uh, visit, you know, but it does need to be reviewed and that information should be sent out and noted that the patient has reviewed it because of the emergency use status. So I think that's an excellent point and something where now that we will be utilizing more on the outpatient side as the treatment shifts from inpatient to outpatient focus, um, we've got to make sure that we are counseling and documenting appropriately. That's great, thank you. And I, I will put our email addresses in the um, chat here. Um, if there's any questions, we can certainly find you the right person to help answer that. Um, but that's Dimple and, and my email address. I saw that Anjali was on here, one of our ACO pharmacists. eamon has been on here. Uh, Alekia, the, the, we have plenty of people that can certainly jump in and help. Shoot us an email and, and we'll be happy to uh, assist. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Lice. Uh, just so everyone knows, we did record this session. Uh, it will be posted on our Enduring uh, Learning page uh, in a couple of days, as well as we will share with you the presentation that was shown today. Are there any additional questions? I see Dr. Washington has joined us on her PTO, and she says that Dr. Sharris and Dr. Louder also thank you for joining us today and for participating. So with that said, thank you again to our presenters, Tim and Dimple and Dr. Bulan for your time and everyone for your time uh, for taking out um, and joining us on this critical call today. Have a good afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.